Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the second talk of the Cook Physics Department Colloquia series. Today, I'm very pleased to uh, present Professor Thomas Sutmeyer to you. Uh, I will introduce him briefly. Uh, Professor Sutmeyer is currently the director of the physics department at the University of Neuchâtel, Switzerland. Uh, he is a well-known name in ultrafast optics, so I'm not going to go into those details. Uh, briefly on his bio, he studied at Leibniz University in Hannover and the ENS in Paris from 1992 to 1996, receiving his uh, physics degree, undergraduate degree, uh, during which he was supported by um, uh, the Volks Fellowship from Germany and the European Union. He did his master's also at uh, Hanover University and then did his PhD in physics at the ETH Switzerland from 1999 to 2003, well, finishing uh, a few months before me uh, in terms of the PhD. After his PhD, he worked as a research engineer in the Sony Corporation in Tokyo until 2005. From 2005 until 2011, he worked as a senior si staff scientist in the physics department back at the ETH. In 2001, he got the ERC grant from the EU as well as being appointed uh, as full professor at the University of Neuchâtel. He is presently the uh, head of the Time and Frequency Laboratory at his university. Um, Thomas Tukmeyer also serves the Ultrafessor Optics Community as an associate member of Optics Express in addition to chairmanship, co-chairmanship, and community membership of various international conferences. Um, I'm very happy to present him to you and looking forward to listening his, to his talk. Yeah, thank you very much, Ömer. Um, it is really great to be here. It is a pleasure uh, to be able to give this talk. Also, thanks a lot for the lab visits. I have to say that I'm deeply impressed by the equipment that I've seen here, a large number of new buildings, but more importantly also a large number of very enthusiastic students. Uh, it was fun discussing and I'm looking forward to continue this tomorrow. So today I would like to talk about recent trends in ultrafast lasers and frequency comps. By the way, this is a picture of Neuchâtel. So we are here at the lake of Neuchâtel. Um, our university has several buildings. Our building is here somewhere. And uh, many of you might not know where is Neuchâtel. So, well, let's start with Switzerland. So this is Switzerland. There you have France, Germany, some other countries. There's Munich, Paris, and uh, here Milan. And Neuchâtel is in the middle of Switzerland. So here you have Zurich. There you have Geneva, Lausanne, and we are in the middle. And the lake of Neuchâtel is actually the largest lake in Switzerland. Well, this is because the two bigger lakes are actually shared either with Germany or with France. Um, our group at the university has about 25 people. So this is a picture of all of us. Uh, we are two professors in the Time and Frequency Laboratory, Gaetano Miletti and me. And in my subgroup, we have about 15 scientists working on various aspects of time frequency. So this is a picture of a ski strip that we did recently. Not everybody is here. You might know Kutan, uh, who is over there. So this was, I think, uh, his first skiing experience. And I'm glad to say that he uh, survived everything and did very well. So I'm talking about lasers, but we are the time frequency laboratory. So how does it come together? Well, first of all, the Neuchâtel region is a region in which time measurements are quite important. So the local industry is strongly based on the watchmaking industry, but also even on the atomic clock making industry. So this is one old example of um, a clock that has been done, which is now in the museum in Neuchâtel. And today, on the other hand, we bring this together with light. That's because light allows us to do extremely precise measurements. And that's what I'm trying to explain a little bit in the following. And Irma told me that a lot of you are actually not in the physics program or in the physics graduate program, but undergraduate program. So I will start with some pretty fundamental basics. I hope the people who know better will not be annoyed by it. 
afterwards I will also talk a, a, a little bit more about the detailed aspects of our work. Okay, so let's start with time. For a long time, humans defined the time by some periodic events. The easiest periodic event is taking, for example, the rotation of the Earth, the date, um, or what you also could do is taking the rotation of the Earth around the Sun. And for a long, long time, this was used for the definition of the time. Only in the 60s, approximately 60s, 70s, a redefinition of the time was done, and there a transition in the cesium atom was used, which is in the microwave region. So it's a transition of about 9 gigahertz, uh, several times higher than the frequency of your microwave, and uh, that defines now the second. So uh, even number of the oscillations is the definition of the second. And humans have done a great job in getting better and better precision for clocks. So initially in the year 1000, uh, the precision was not very high. So I mean there you were talking about several hundred seconds per day of unprecision. So here you can see precision as function of time. But then especially also with requirements of navigation. So if you have a ship, you want to be very precise, you need a chronometer. And there a race started to develop more and more precise clocks. And uh, afterwards, quartz clocks came with higher and higher precision than the first cesium clocks. They had a microsecond per day. And nowadays, with the primary cesium clocks, you can get to a precision of 100 picoseconds per day. Well, this, is, this raises a first question. What the hell is a picosecond? Because uh, this is a unit which is not really that usual. I mean, everybody knows about the second. That's the time scale with which humans can easily identify things. If you go to the millisecond regime, you already need fast photography to resolve some events. Uh, microseconds uh, start to be even more complicated. Nanoseconds, you're on the range of microtechnology, computer frequencies. And then the picosecond, that's 10 to the minus 12. And that's the time that you need, for example, for some processes in molecules. And if you can then go to the femtosecond regime, uh, you are in the regime in which you can have chemical reactions occurring. Femtoseconds, that's then 10 to the minus 15 seconds. So that means if you have 100 picoseconds per day, you are at the precision of 10 to the minus 15. So, okay, 10 to the minus 15, what does it say, what does it mean? Well, let's have a look at this precision on geological timescales. So, this is a time scale of the Earth. So, starting from the formation of the Earth, about uh, two point, no, 4.6 billion years ago. And um, so, we are now here. And if we now imagine that we would be able to measure the time from one important event, uh, one very important event was just 100 million years after the formation of the Earth. This was a collision of the Earth with a big, well, mass size object, which was the origin of the formation to the Moon, at least according to the latest interpretations. And um, if we would be able to start the clock at this time, when the Moon was formed, so 4.5 billion years ago, with a precision of 10 to the minus 15, today it would only be off by 142 seconds. So this is a pretty impressive accuracy that you can get. Or let's take another example. So here, at the end of this time scale, the extinction of the dinosaurs happened. Some people believe it's also linked to some asteroid colliding with Earth, but uh, people do not really know where exactly it came, comes from. Uh, but uh, if, you, if you would be able to measure this time scale with 10 to the minus 50, you would be on the second time scale. So you really can measure extremely precisely events at the 10 to the minus 15 level. 
Um, in Neuchâtel, we are developing one of these primary fountain cesium clocks. So the idea is that you have a hyperfine level transition in the cesium, and you excite it, and then you want to leave the cesium atom alone as long as possible, and then afterwards, after a certain time, ask the state again. The way how is it done? Uh, it's done in a fountain system. You throw the atoms into the air, or well, into the vacuum, and then look at it about half a second to a second later. And uh, all other clocks, uh, based on this principle, are operating in a pulse mode. And in Neuchâtel, we are developing for more than 10 years a system where it's actually a continuous fountain. So it's a parabolic clock, which was done which was started under my predecessor, Pierre Thoman. And we are getting close to having first results with this clock, which is a different operation principle to the normal fountain clocks. And uh, with this, we hope that we can bring Switzerland back to the countries that define the international atomic time, because unfortunately, for a watchmaking country like Switzerland, it's hard to accept but currently Switzerland does not define the international atomic time. And I think actually Turkey does. So we hope that we can catch up. With this, we'll also be able to participate in quite interesting projects, uh, comparing, for example, this parabolic clock uh, with other clocks that work in the standard way. That can be done via a project called ACES of the European Space Agency, where we are partner. And um, here the idea is that you put some atomic clock onto the International Space Station, and then you can compare different clocks worldwide via radio or laser links to the space station. So let's come back to this diagram. Well, why am I not talking about standard atomic clocks if before I was talking about light and higher precision? Well, this is because actually some breakthrough happened in the year 2000 and that was a realization of a development in the laser world which will I explain a little bit later more in detail and that then resulted in the realization of optical atomic clocks and with the optical atomic clocks we now have a potential to go to 10 to the minus 17, 10 to the minus 18 so a factor of 100 to 1,000 better than what is possible with the current clocks. And this then gives really exciting possibilities for further measurements, also concerning about, well, fundamental uh, physics. So what do we need for a clock? Well, we need some oscillating thing and then we need a means to count it. So in a standard clock, we have a pendulum, and uh, then we have a counter, which can measure the time in practical units. So if we do this with mechanics, life is easy. We can just build it using standard techniques. Uh, if we have a quartz resonator, we are now at about a million oscillations per second. It gets faster and faster, but that's also easy to count with electronics. Even if we go to the microwave world, so uh, if we now have, for example, the 9 gigahertz transition of the cesium, it's still possible to measure this relatively easily with electronics. Um, in general, the higher the repetition rate of the oscillator is, the higher the potential is for precision. Uh, it depends certainly also how strongly the system is perturbated. But uh, if you go to optics, you have oscillations which are even much, much faster. You are then talking about hundreds of terahertz. And this gives a potential for much higher precision. Also, these atomic transitions are well isolated from the rest of the world, and this really gives you a large potential to go to higher, higher um, accuracies. Uh, so one very simple system how you can build a very stable optical resonator or optical oscillator is simply by using two mirrors. Uh, that's a system which has been done in many institutes. I'm just showing you an example of how we did it in Neuchâtel. So here we have just two mirrors and uh, we just want to isolate these mirrors from the rest of the world. 
So we put it then into some special housing, uh, gold coated, and then we have three different layers. Uh, we have put it into a special way that vibrations are not important, put it into another housing again, finally uh, shielding it then into vacuum, and this then gives us a reference cavity which we can use for extremely high stability. And this allows us then to have a reference cavity where we can go to, to 10 to the minus 15 or better. But the big problem that you have with optics is that, well, if you have so many oscillations per second, how on earth can you count these oscillations? Electronics is not fast enough anymore. There is no simple way, or for a long time there was no simple way to simply count in a phase stable way the number of oscillations. And uh, for this, you can use laser technology. Uh, so, as some of you are graduate students, I also want to say a few words about lasers. So, laser light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation um, has inspired a lot of um, well appearances in more popular science. Uh, one of the first appearances was. Uh, in a Bond movie where they, uh, already in the 60s, were using a laser to uh, cut Mr. Bond into two. Well, I have to say, this biomedical application at that time was not really real. Uh, lasers at that time were not powerful enough to do such a job. But okay, so what is a laser? So you just take a cavity, so two mirrors, in between you can have a standing wave of light, and then you put some energy into it by using an amplifying medium. So you have an amplifying medium, you excite it with a pump source, and then you can get a population inversion. And uh, since Einstein, we know that this can then be used for amplification of light. And it's a little bit like if I would take this microphone, bring it close to a loudspeaker, you would hear the beep, and that would be a kind of feedback. You have an oscillator with an amplifier, and that gives you a feedback, and you can get, like the beep for the microphone, a very pure frequency. So this is, this is the basic idea of a laser. And compared to a standard light that you have, you have one key advantage, that is the coherence that you get. So with a laser, you have the spatial coherence, which allows you propagation over long distances, even up to the moon, or you also can focus it down to very small spot sizes, concentrate a lot of energy into a small spot size. And this is actually steel that is cut with a speed which is quite incredible. So today, with high power lasers, uh, it would not be a problem to cut a human into two in a very, very short time. So this is the advantage of the spatial coherence of this laser beam, sending light over large distances or focusing it down to the regions of the wavelengths of the light, to the micrometer region, typically. Uh, but you also have an additional coherence, which is the temporal coherence. And uh, this allows you to either have a very long duration and an extremely narrow small spectrum, or on the other hand, you can also create very, very short pulses and have a huge spectrum. And that's something which I quickly want to show here in this animation. So it's a, basically a Fourier transform, what you're doing. So if, if I just take a couple of modes, so if I just have a laser oscillator, and so I just have a wave oscillating in there, so that's one mirror, that's the other, other mirror, and I don't know, okay, just one second. Okay, so here you have just one mode running into an oscillator, so mirror one, mirror two. You have the standing wave pattern, which is moving. And if you now add additional modes into it, so now I have a couple of more modes, then suddenly I start to have some pulse-like structure that evolves. All these modes have to be added in a phase-stable way. That's why you also call it mode locking. So the 
you have the individual modes, the longitudinal modes of the laser cavity that you lock phase stably together. And the more and the more modes you put into it, now I'm putting a couple of more modes to it, the more I have something which is like a pulse that is oscillating in the cavity. And now if I take really a lot of the modes, then suddenly I have a wave packet which is oscillating inside the cavity. And so the basic message is the broader the optical spectrum is, the more of these individual single lines I put into the cavity, the shorter the pulse gets. And that's a way of mode blocking. So with this you can generate extremely short pulses. Uh, you can go to the level of the femtoseconds. So just, and this allows you to resolve very fast processes. So let's just have a look at different timescales. Why is it important to be able to resolve fast processes? Well, with the eye, we are only able to distinguish images which are in the, in the millisecond regime. I mean, if you go to a cinema, you have 24 images per second, and you are not able to see the individual images anymore. It looks like, like a moving action. Um, that makes it very hard for humans to identify fast processes. And uh, even a process like how is a horse running was for a long time hard to understand. So. Uh, People were wondering how does a horse run in, uh, for quite a long time. Uh, in the gallop of a horse, does a horse lift all the feet or not? And uh, here is a picture which was drawn by George Stubbs, uh, 1724. And um, he was considered to be one of the biggest painters for horses. Uh, but he actually got it wrong, so this should be a picture of a galloping horse. But, uh, well, in the end, all of the feet are above the ground, and that's a situation which is actually not real. Uh, but people were not able to resolve this. That's why uh, I think it was Mr. Stanford uh, had a bet on the movement of the horse, and he said, uh, I think it was $10,000 or something like this, I give it to the person who can prove to me if the horses are in the air during the gallop of a horse or not. And uh, Mr. Muybridge in 1878 actually could resolve this problem by doing fast photography in the millisecond domain. So he had several cameras arranged and then with this he was able to do these movements, these measurements. And the moment where the horses uh, have all the feet in the air is actually now. So it is not when the horses are on the long side, there is always one touching the ground, but actually when the feet are close to each other. So being able to resolve fast events allows you to understand processes of the nature. And um, another pioneer for such measurements was Harold Edgerton. So he uses flashlights uh, to resolve events on the microsecond scale. So here, for example, there are a couple of nice pictures that he took uh, the movement of somebody in sports, for example, or what happens if you have an apple and you shoot a bullet through the apple. Another thing which I find quite astonishing is, um, well, what happens when you destroy a balloon. So here he has a bullet which goes through three balloons. And uh, you can now see what happens. This one was the first to be destroyed, so it's already uh, losing his form. Uh, this balloon still keeps its original form, but here on the other end it's already destroyed. So you can learn something how systems are collapsing on a fast time scale. Well, going even further in resolution, so if you now use femtosecond lasers, you can do measurements on a hundred femtosecond timescale, uh, or even faster. 
and that allowed Ahmed Zewail in 94 to understand which transitions occur during chemical reactions. So understanding which pass of several passes that you have during a chemical reaction is in reality followed. And that got him the Nobel Prize a few years later. So there's definitely a point in trying to have very short pulses. Uh, you can use it for, for many, many measurements. So the first examples that I was giving was on accessing ultra-short timescales. Uh, if you are thinking about more practical applications, you can, for example, also use it for very fast communications because you can put a lot of events into one second. A second area is that, well, laser light, because of the coherence, you can focus it in space. If now you also focus the energy in time, you can create extremely high intensities. And that allows you to do material processing. So here at the university in Oemers lab, some really uh, interesting studies are done on understanding what happens to the materials and improving material processing further. So this is one of the big things, I think, in technology that will happen in the next few years. If you have new materials, like for example carbon fibers or so, it's extremely hard to uh, manufacture them with standard tools. And the laser, ultra-fast laser, is really the right tool to do it. Also, if you, if you look at your cell phone, many, many of these components are actually done by the laser. The cutting of the glass uh, such that it stays very stable is actually done with femtosecond lasers nowadays. Another possibility is also to access such high intensities that you can ionize atoms, that you can really do fundamental investigations of, of processes. And a third thing that you have with these ultra-fast pulses is, well, I showed you before how the different modes couple together to generate this short pulse. So you have, that means that with these short pulses you have a broad optical spectrum which consists of individual lines. And you can also make these lines very, very stable. And that is highly attractive for precision spectroscopy. And that is actually the technology that allows to build the optical atomic blocks. Now, why is this so important? Well, what we want to have is a possibility to link a very, very stable frequency of the light, so hundreds of terahertz, to something that we can measure. And measuring means that we would like to have microwaves. And the idea is, that we need a kind of ruler, so we have something turning extremely fast and we want to face stably, like a gear work, link it to something slow. So that even if this turns extremely fast, we know exactly with a slow wheel how many of the optical turns we had in total. And that's what, something that can be done if you have this extremely precise frequency con you can bring another frequency close to it and then measure a beating signal which is in the microwave region. So you create a frequency comp which is very, very stable and you can uh, do this using optical technologies and then you can measure the beating and this gives you then the stable microwave signal. That was one of the big revolutions, uh, I would even say in physics in general, uh, it resulted in a Nobel Prize for Hensch and Hall when they did it. Uh, I think the Nobel Prize was given in 2005 and the invention was in 2000, so a very short time after its invention, which also highlights the large potential that you still have. And in terms of science, there's really a large class of measurements that you can do, length measurements, time frequency transfer, fundamental physics, you can even use these frequency comps for looking for extraterrestrial planets uh, which are Earth-like because for this you need spectrometers that can look at stars and detect very, very fine frequency shifts and you can use these comps to, um, well, to, to uh, calibrate an astronomic spectrometer to a higher level than what is currently possible. On the other hand, you can also use it for stuff like even cryptography, arbitrary waveform generation, sensing, spectroscopy. Uh, you have 
a large number of precise frequencies, so you can look at many, many uh, transitions at the same time. This would, for example, allow for a device where you can do an analysis of a guess, uh, trying to detect some health problems that you may have. Uh, or you can also use it for another thing, which is uh, atosecond science, where then this carrier envelope offset frequency um, in the frequency com actually corresponds to a phase shift between the envelope and the pulse. I don't want to go here too much into the details, but you have physical effects for which this is really, really important. Now, the basis of the whole frequency technology is actually a femtosecond laser. So, you have a system where you have a centripetal absorber, which acts as a mode-locking element. Uh, so, you have the gain and you have one element which absorbs the pulse and has lower losses if there is a pulse in CW light. And in this way, you get an operation where you just have then single pulses coming out of the laser. So you have one pulse oscillating backward and forward inside the laser cavity, as you could see in this animation. And the easiest way to get this operation is by using a saturable absorber. Now, in the following, I want to go a little bit more into the details on the research of such frequency cons. So it would be somewhat more technical. Uh, so different research directions on one side, what you would like to have is low noise. So you would like to have the individual lines in your frequency com or that you get from the ultra-fast laser as narrow and as stable as possible. A second area is that for many applications you actually would like to have higher repetition rates. If you increase the repetition rate, which means you make the cavity shorter, then actually you have larger spacing of the individual modes. And um, that means if you have uh, given energy, uh, given average power, like for example one watt, you will concentrate this uh, more strongly, so you have more power in the individual lines. Then another direction is that you would like to go to higher and higher power levels. That would just increase the power of all different modes. For many applications, there's a big advantage. Uh, for example, you would be able to faster detect some chemicals or use it for some other applications. And finally, uh, you also would like to cover a larger spectral region. So typically, most lasers are working in the infrared region. You can cover a little bit into the visible with nonlinear optics, but uh, if you're at 100 nanometers, it's really hard to get laser solutions. There are also quite some exciting physical systems which are in the VUV or in the extreme ultraviolet, and you would would like to be able to cover also these wavelengths really, so to go to much, much shorter wavelengths. And finally, one very important aspect, especially if you think about devices for biomedical detection, is that you would like to have compact systems. Uh, you don't want to give to your doctor a device which uh, is, I don't know, a cube meter large and costs a million euros if it's about some, some chemical detection. Ideally, you would like to have something which is very, very short. So let's start with the first point, which is a compact, which is a low noise. So then I'm talking a little bit of different research directions that we are currently following in my institute. Uh, so in order to stabilize the CO frequency, so imagine that this is now your frequency comb, we have two different sources of things that annoy you that you would like to stabilize. Uh, one is that you have a kind of uh, shifting of the whole COM, which is then a change of the FCO. And then the second thing is that you have a breathing of the repetition rate. So here you keep the FCO, which is a frequency. If you expand this COM to zero uh, between here and the zero line. And um, now you would like to stabilize both of them to make it ultra stable. And the breathing, you can change it easily by changing the length of the cavity, using, for example, an actuator in the cavity. And for the shifting, you need an element which has different dispersion. And uh, there are different possibilities. 
So I'm quickly going over different technologies. If you don't understand everything, it's also not so hard. The typical way how it was done was by using uh, feedback to the game, because by the game you then have a different pulse energy in it, and for example things like nonlinearity will behave differently with respect to dispersion. And uh, so that means that you can try to act on the pump current. Another possibility is that you also, but there you have the disadvantage that the lifetime of the game limits you. And um, therefore you could also introduce, for example, a pump AOM. Another possibility is that you really then inside the cavity use an AOM. Then you completely get rid of the limitation that you have from the gain lifetime. You can have a very high modulation bandwidth, but you need to add an additional element in the cavity, which is somewhat annoying in terms of nonlinearity and dispersion. Uh, there was recently a result where they used the graphene electro optical modulator uh, that allowed to go to uh, megahertz frequencies, but the disadvantage was that you had quite high losses, so it's only attractive for fiber lasers. Now, what we did recently is a new system where we use optical optical modulation of the element that we anyway use for the mode locking. So we have an additional laser which just has a low power, a few tens of milliwatts, and shines onto the CSAM, and in this way we can reduce the overall cavity losses. And that allowed uh, stability of the CO. Because all these components are anyway in the laser, we just add a little bit of light on the CSAM, we have no additional nonlinearity or dispersion, and we have extremely low losses and extremely great damage properties. So the laser setup that we are using is this here. So that is a solid state laser, the gain material, a couple of different mirrors, ping pong, in order to get the right dispersion. And then here we have the CSAM for the mode locking. And then we just put a second pump there, a few milliwatts at 800 nanometers, which was pumping the CSAM. The laser generated uh, CO stabilized feed at a uh, zero stabilized light at 1.5 micrometers. Oops. And uh, so that is the result that we obtained when we could CO stabilize the laser using the standard feedback to the pump current on one side, and we could compare it to a feedback to the CSAM. And that's the transfer function that we get for the modulation to the gain. So here you can see the frequency, uh, that's 10 kilohertz, so already at a few kilohertz we cannot do any modulation anymore, and that's because of the Airbion gain lifetime. If we now do the feedback to the CSAM, we actually can go to much, much higher frequency, several hundred kilohertz. So it's significantly faster. And um, at the moment, it looks as if we would be actually modulated by the current driver that we're using, because that also had about 300 kilohertz specified bandwidth. Now using this, we could do a CO stabilization, which was substantially better than the one that we got with the stabilization of the pump current. So we had a 20 dB improvement of the CO peak, 10 times higher bandwidth of the transfer function, and also four times lower Allen deviation, and this is extremely interesting for the generation of low noise microwave radiation. Now it would be interesting to use this approach to uh, stabilize high power lasers, because there you really have the key advantage uh, of this technology, you don't add any additional element, and it's also very attractive to stabilize noisy lasers, which otherwise are challenging to stabilize. Okay, a few comments to the high repetition rate. I don't have much time left, by the way, how much time do I have? Until five minutes, ten minutes? Ten minutes, ten minutes okay. Uh, so, uh, just a few words to a high repetition rate laser. So, diet pump solid state lasers are quite interesting because you can make the gain material very short and use extremely short cavities. Uh, so here is a picture of a 100 gigahertz type from solid state laser. So this is the laser crystal 
uh, with an output coupler coating. This is a curved mirror, and this here is a CSAM. And it all is brought together on the millimeter scale. And uh, that allows you to go to extremely high repetition rates, so 100 gigahertz. The pulse duration achieved uh, was in the end about one picosecond, 35 milliwatts. This is not enough to enable CO stabilization, but it just shows the potential of dye pump solid state lasers for high repetition rate sources. The first gigahertz self-referenceable frequency bomb, we demonstrated it in 2011, and uh, we are currently working on stabilizing the system. And we also scaled the repetition rate up to five gigahertz. Um, in terms of high average power, uh, the key challenge that you have is that you need to get rid of the thermal properties. So um, at the moment, there is quite large motivation to go with femtosecond lasers to higher and higher repetition rates. So here you can see a diagram, uh, pulse energy as function of repetition rate. And amplifiers have a low repetition rate, but very high pulse energies. Um, oscillators have low energies, high repetition rates. That was a situation maybe a couple of years ago. Both technologies were limited to average power levels. These are here in these diagonal lines to less than about 10 watts. And now in the last few years, the power levels have been scaled higher and higher. So now technologies reach up to the 100 watt kilowatt regime, both from the amplifier and the oscillator side. And the advantage of increasing the repetition rates is that in industry you can increase the throughput. Uh, in science you can reduce measurement time because you can do more measurements in, in a certain amount of time. And the key challenge that you have if you want to go to high power levels is that you have thermal effects. You always have a quantum defect in a laser. You deposit some heat in the material and you need to get rid of it. Uh, otherwise, you have thermal problems, aberration, the crystal might even break or the fiber might burn. And um, the best technologies are technologies which have a very high surface to volume ratio so that you can do efficient cooling. Uh, that's the fiber geometry, the slab geometry, and the thin disk geometry. And both the fiber and the slab geometry in terms of amplifier systems can go to several hundred watts of power level. So uh, here are systems take a oscillator, send it into a stretcher, then have several amplifier systems, afterwards a power amplifier, and then compress it back again, and there you can get to several hundred watts. But the overall system is rather complex. You also have slab amplifiers like the inner slab amplifier, where you can get kilowatt power levels. Um, but for all of these, you actually need oscillators and then a lot of amplifiers. And the thinnest technology has one advantage that you directly from the oscillator can get very, very high power levels. So in the thin disk, the idea is that you just have a 100 micrometer thick disk and you use it with millimeter or centimeter size of beams in reflection and that allows for very, very good cooling. Now, the average power of such ultra-fast laser oscillators went up quite a lot. So uh, initially, uh, that was when I started my PhD, when we worked on ultra-fast synthesis lasers, we got the first one running with 16 watt average power. So now over the years, we are today at 275 watt of average power directly from one single oscillator. And uh, it is increasing and increasing. And here you can see a system, how, how such a laser works. So just one second. Okay. It cannot open the specified file, which is somewhat annoying, I have to say. Just two seconds, otherwise we can do it later. Um, okay, it's here. This guy. So now it should work. If the computer doesn't crash.
Okay, so here you can see the thin disk laser head. Here you have the very, very thin disk in the middle. And because the disk is so thin in order to get a good pump absorption, we actually have to send the pump beam several times over the disk because the typical absorption length in such materials with a reasonable doping is a few millimeters. The disk only has a hundred micrometer, so you need a slightly more complex arrangement, but with the parabolic mirrors and some back reflectors this can be achieved. So there you can get very, very high slope efficiencies. These lasers are actually very efficient. Uh, in industry, in CW operation, you can buy them, I think now up to 16 kilowatts uh, multi-mode. So if you buy a Audi or Mercedes, there's a pretty good chance that parts of it have, have been processed by using the thinnest lasers. Okay, so this is the laser head. We have the amplifying gain material in there. And then you just bring a couple of mirrors around it. Here you have the CSEM, and then you have a motor laser. So that's kind of the principle how the overall system works. I just want to stop it for one second. Just show the final cavity again. So here you then have the laser itself. You just use the disc as a folding mirror. Then you have many other mirrors in addition. Uh, most of them are for dispersion compensation. The CSEM is one mode locking element and here the output coupler. So in principle, it is a really simple setup which allows you in an efficient way to go to very high power levels. And uh, we recently demonstrated that you can also stabilize such a laser, which initially was not obvious because of the multi-mode, died in 2012. We could demonstrate uh, the first CO beat frequency detection of such a laser. And then in 2013, end of last year, we could finally uh, demonstrate uh, the first stabilization of the CSEM mode of thin disk laser. Um, there we obtained an integrated phase noise of only 120 milliradian from 1 hertz to 1 megahertz which is a very good result. So, um, in terms of spectral coverage, uh, we would like to go to shorter and shorter wavelengths. And there actually, you have another advantage. If you go to shorter wavelengths, you can have more bandwidth, and that allows you to go to shorter pulse duration. So if you look at the pulse duration that was achieved as function of year, until the year of 2000, you were limited to the femtosecond regime, now, actually, there is the other second revolution. You go to a much shorter wavelengths in the VUV, XUV spectral regime, and you go, can generate other second pulses. And that allows you to look at new phenomena, like, for example, the tunneling time that happens into atomic transitions. And um, also, light in this range is highly attractive for other things, like uh, microscopy and lithography and so on. Uh, you can generate it with a free electron laser, but um, it's a rather expensive and complicated system. Uh, the best way to do it on a tabletop is to use high harmonic generation. What you do there is you take a very energetic femtosecond pulse, focus it into a gas target. In the gas target, you ionize the atom, the laser field rips apart an electron, but then it oscillates back, brings the electron back to the core, and you can have a recombination, and then the energy of the electron is released in highly energetic photons, so here you can see a typical spectrum that can be obtained, in this case going up to 180 electron volts. And people have demonstrated that you even can go to one nanometer. The big problem of this system is that the conversion efficiency really, really sucks. Uh, you typically have 10 to the minus 8 to 10 to the minus 6, of efficiency and you use a highly energetic amplifier which has maybe 10 watt average power and works at a kilohertz repetition rate. So the flux is too low for many applications. The kilohertz rep repetition rate also uh, is a challenge. You cannot use it for frequency comms and also for signal noise. It's quite tough. And we are exploring an approach where we would like to generate the harmonics directly inside the thin disk laser. So inside the thin disk laser, we can have very energetic short pulses. We put the gas target in there, and then we can recycle the light inside the resonator. Uh, it's an approach similar to things that have been demonstrated with passive cavities. 
in the group of UNI and also at the MPQ. And uh, this project is funded by the ERC. And we are quite confident that we have, have a good chance to get there. So in terms of pulse duration, here you can see pulse duration of ytterbium lasers or bulk lasers as function of time. So for the standard bulk lasers using normal crystals, it already has gone down uh, pretty strongly, 34 femtoseconds. And now also for the ytterbium dot thinnest lasers, very recently we managed to get 62 femtoseconds. And in terms of the intracavity peak power, which is a challenge where we would like to have several hundreds of megawatts, even up to a gigawatt. Uh, here you can see different thinnest lasers, intracavity peak power, pulse duration. And there, with this 62 femtosecond laser, we're already at 50 megawatt. We had other lasers where it was already in the kilo, uh, in the hundreds of megawatt regime. So this looks very promising. And uh, yeah, we also, one challenge are the mirrors. We will do the mirror coatings ourselves using an IBS coating machine. And finally, uh, I would like to discuss very briefly the compactness of these sources. So one method is to use very small solid state lasers, also fiber lasers have large potential. But ultimately, if you want to go to something really short, what you would like to have is integrated ultra-fast lasers, ideally based on semiconductors directly. Today, a lot of the lasers are size of a meter, costing several hundred thousands. And uh, the idea would be to go to other geometries where you can do it with semiconductor lasers. And uh, we have a project where we're working strongly together with ETH, and where we hope that we can use vertical semiconductor emitting lasers, which then can be used for such applications. But I think I don't have time to go further into the details of this project. So I just would like to summarize a little bit our activities. Um, so we are in Neuchâtel trying to investigate the combination of time frequency research, ultra-fast laser research, bringing together various systems from high power laser systems and high harmonic generation to fountain clock research. We also have other activities which I didn't mention, like for example quantum cascade lasers or some sensing applications with the European Space Agency. And uh, many of our applications are currently driven by frequency comms, expanding the wavelengths region to shorter wavelengths but also to longer wavelengths. And uh, if you found this type of work interesting. We are always looking for talented uh, PhD students or also postdocs. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to uh, discuss your questions. So we have time for a few questions. Yeah, actually it's a vexel, so we have, you have a semiconductor reflecting structure and then an external cavity. The gain lifetime of these devices allows you to easily go to the gigahertz regime and there it's already quite interesting. But recently some groups also have demonstrated that you even can go to 200 megahertz. So if you optimize the gain structure for a little bit longer lifetime, then you're in the same profile like the standard laser. But you have the disadvantage with such a cavity, 100 megahertz repetition rate corresponds to 1.5 meter cavity length. You can fold it, make it more compact, but I think having a gigahertz laser, which is really small, is, is way more interesting. Well, uh, let's thank the speaker again. And, and uh, the speaker will be available outside. We also are serving tea, uh, so come and join us. In